Okay, well, we'll see what happens. So I'll put this one in my pocket like that, and hopefully this is going to record the video, and that's going to record the... I don't know. We'll see what happens. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, let me turn off the light over here. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So the last time, that was two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, when we had a fast, we, <clears throat> we talked about uh, uh, <clears throat> different types of operators and uh, classes with resources and all the things, and we started something, we called it my string. And in that my string of ours, we created and encapsulated something that can represent a string. And we went through it with different types of things like constructors, uh, 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 one argument constructor, default constructor. Um, we talked about copy constructor, a copy assignment, and um, uh, the destructor. We called those rule of three, which essentially means if any object that you create uh, holds the resources out of, uh, of its uh, territory, you need to be able to uh, copy and move it around uh, safely. And that's what those three things do. We talked about different types of operators, binary operators, unary operators, unary operators that are postfix, which is only plus plus and minus minus. We talked about indexing operator and how um, well, we create different version of the same operator based, based on constantness, if that's the word of the operator, so the operator can be called in different places. All right, so, so the operator can be called uh, in both situations where the object is constant, line 33, or where the object is not constant, 32, which means operator in 32 can, is actually uh, a mutator, and operator at line 33, it's a query. It doesn't change the, the object. Then we talked about creating default, uh, like standard read and writes, and we said at any moment we create a read and write, that read and write can pass through, uh, should pass through the I stream. Now in this case, I added a delimiter because it was a string, and many people just copied this thing in the test as their display for, I think the mug or something, and they added a delimiter over there. I mean. Don't copy and paste code, just use your, okay. But anyways, this is the delimiter that you see is added because we are designing a string. So the standard one is always O stream, print O stream in and out, uh, in and out, and read I stream, I stream in and out, okay? And we create helper operators when uh, the scenario is in two different, two, two cases. Uh, uh, number one, uh, the uh, uh, the nature of the function doesn't belong to the class itself, which means the class that I have over here that is operator plus does not belong to the class, but it works closely with the class. That's when we create a helper function. Helper functions should call the methods of the of the class to do something, and also we created uh, uh, we we said we sh we need to create helper functions. When I said helper function, it includes operators too, and we said uh, we create uh, uh, helper functions when we don't have access to the left hand operator of the uh, of an operator overload. So. Uh, if the left hand object is an object that you cannot modify, obviously it cannot be the member. Therefore, you cannot overload the operator as a member. Therefore, you're going to make it a friend. No, sorry, never friend. Friends, knife in the back. Remember, we never use friends. Friends are bad. Okay? So, we, uh, I didn't even teach friends. I don't want you to know what friends are uh, unless we know how we are using it. So, for now, assume that there is no such thing as friends. Uh, so we make them as helpers, okay? And helper functions, again, call uh, other, uh, helper operators call uh, the methods to accomplish whatever it's, uh, it's being happening over here, which is, in this case, <clears throat> the helper functions in here uh, 
are working as follows. So essentially, in these two operators that I'm overloading, uh, as you see, the insertion operator is calling the print of the uh, left-hand operator, and the extraction operator is calling read of the operator, and makes it looks like as if those methods belong to C in and C out where they are at. And that's why we call them helpers. So that was the uh, uh, kind of uh, quick review of what we have done last time to go through all these good stuff. Uh, <clears throat> today, uh, we are going to go into something much simpler. Okay? So we're going to start doing a, uh, kind of a uh, uh, writing an example that uh, try to make sense out of things. So uh, we'll talk about animals today. So, I want to design something that represents an animal for me in, in the system, okay? So, to represent an animal, my encapsulation of an animal is this very simple thing. Yeah, this is a silly example that I bring up every semester. It just fits for the thing that I want to do. So, as I was saying, uh, my encapsulation of an animal is... Uh, something that has some kind of a name, whatever it is. I have rule of three over here for absolutely no reason, because animal doesn't have anything outside of his territory. I just added it over here in case you want to try it and see if it, uh, how it runs. And So completely ignore these uh, rule of three. The rule of three and the structure is just for printing messages so we know when they are called. Okay, and we're going to remove it in the next example. So next examples are not going to have a copy and an assignment. It's just for this one, just for the heck of it. So we say an animal has a name. You can extract its name. You can set its name. So you have a query and you have a setter over here that sets the name of the animal. We have a constructor that builds an animal with a name, and if it doesn't have a name, it calls it nameless. So essentially, it has two constructors, a default constructor and a one-argument constructor. Also, an animal can act, can move, and make a sound. Fair enough? So that's my animal. And when I look at the animal, that's how it works. I have some debugging thingy set up, yeah, and that debug that we have set up over there works as follows. <clears throat> so it's an, uh, a global variable debug. We talked about this before. So I set that thing to true to activate the, uh, the messages up and down. And I have some stuff in my utils in here filled up with some stuff, so I don't use string header file and fail, and so all the things about uh, strings are there. You can use them if you want to. I just copied it from somewhere that I wrote it some time ago, so my util has two lower, lower case of stuff, str cat, compare, string copy length, is it alphabetic, is it space, trim, lower case, some stuff. Yeah. Ignore it. The, what, whatever is useful, use it. If it's not, then don't. And it has different types of get ints, and I have no idea why is it here. It's just copied it. That's it from somewhere. But I don't use them. I just use the, the debug over here. And obviously, utils is instantiated in something called ut. So if I go ut dot something, I can string copy and all the good stuff. So <clears throat> let's see how this animal thingy works. Essentially, the constructor, I uh, set the name, as you see over here. So it sets the name, and uh, uh, the copy construct assignment, never mind about it. Uh, I, set the I, I extract the name by returning the address of the, 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 the name array, and I set the name by copying whatever value that is coming out up to 40 characters into name. And act simply say, act like animal, move like animal, sound like animal, and that's it. Okay? So that's what these functions do. So when my animal is acting, it's going to act like an animal. When my animal is moving, it's going to move like an animal. When my animal is making a sound, it's going to sound like an animal. And at the end, 
when animal is out of the scope, it's got to be removed from the, uh, the, the object's got to be removed from the memory. Are we okay with this? Very simple and straightforward. So essentially, <clears throat> when I run my program, I wish I had a pocket over here so I don't have to wear this hot thing for the microphone. But anyways, uh, uh, so uh, uh, I'm calling my animal Fluffy, and I'm going to say a.act, a.move, a.sound, and I'm going to call it show animal. And show animal receives an animal by value and shows it and so on and so forth. So you can see how the copy constructor and everything works. So essentially this is how it works. It creates the animal. It acts like animal, moves like animal, sounds like animal, shows the animal, and gets out. Program ended. Obviously, if I set the debug to true, you will see that all the messages will come out as when what is being called. So now, as soon as I come over here, it's going to say creating fluffy the animal. So it's actually activating that. Then it's going to say act like animal, yada, yada, yada. When show animal is being called, it's passing A by value to X. Therefore, copy constructor will be called. Therefore, I'm going to have copying fluffy the animal, setting to fluffy, showing fluffy, Copying fluffy animal, setting again. So all these copying and stuff happening, the second copy is because I'm returning something by value. Although it's not being used, it calls the copy constructor anyway. So that's the silly thing. So careful not to pass stuff by value. It's not good for, it's very expensive. You don't want to do that. And at the end, remove the fluffy that. Are we, are we okay with this? Very simple, thing, right? <clears throat> And now, <clears throat> we're gonna, um, the next example, I think, it doesn't have the copy constructor and stuff, so uh, keep that in mind. But let's bring it up. So, now I want to create a cat. Okay? Now, is cat an animal? Yes, it is, right? Because cat is an animal, I do not need to reinvent the wheel. I do not need to recreate an animal. All I can say is cat is an animal that does such and such. Right? That's the reality of inheritance that we're going to learn today. So in inheritance, you simply say, um, I have a motorcycle that is a bicycle, which you don't need to specify that it has two wheels because a bicycle has two wheels. Okay, and things like that. So I'm going to create a cat out of an animal. And what is the syntax to that? How do we do that? So first of all, obviously, I have my animal, as I had in the other one. <clears throat> and as I told you, I, re I removed all the copy constructor stuff because I'm not interested in it. <clears throat> my animal just has the name and the setter and a default constructor separately this time. And it has a, a one argument constructor. Uh, so it is uh, uh, setting the name and receiving the name. A new thing over here is introduced called protected. We'll talk about it soon. But for now, think about it as public. Okay? Assume it's public. So this is my animal. Okay? If I want to create a cat out of this, this is the syntax for it. So the animal is exactly working like the other one. If you look at the animal in here, CPP over here, <coughs> you will see that it has all the, <coughs> all the features that animal had before. Absolutely no problem with anything. So it is uh, showing just the messages. I didn't change anything for the, so when, when I made that name thing it protected it again assume it's uh, public it doesn't make any difference at this moment and so it has all the stuff that that animal has now how do we create a cat <clears throat> a cat is created as follows nope oh, not like that so you create the class cat you create the class cat and column. When you put a column, it means is a, or in this case, is an, okay? Is a, okay? 
over here you have public. There is nothing other than public in our pay grade. Okay, so this public over here, just say cat is an animal publicly. Why public? We don't care. You can remove the word public. Just assume it's there for no reason. Okay? So cat is an animal. Okay? Because animal had a name, I don't need to add that one to cat anymore. It comes with the territory. It comes with the... Good morning. It comes with the uh, specifications of an animal. So I don't need to create it anymore. But and a cat has one extra feature that animal doesn't have, and it's number of lives, right? So because of that, I'm adding that to it. So a cat is an animal that has certain number of lives, right? And then the rest of the stuff for the cat, I do it as I please. So when a cat is created out of animal, I could stop right over here and don't do anything. I could just remove everything over here and stop. And it would work. Cat would move. Cat, if you call cat move, it would move like an animal. If you say cat sound, it will sound like an animal, not like a cat. It will sound because I didn't implement anything for it. Any of the features of the parent that I want to override, I can start overriding here if I want to make changes. And if I don't want to make changes, if what the parent had is good enough, I can just keep it. Remember, cat is an animal. It has everything that animal has. Okay? And there is no other uh, hidden thing behind it. Obviously, when I'm creating a cat, I can default a cat. And if it's defaulted, obviously, I'm going to set the number of lives to nine. It was nine, right? I think nine is a default number of lives for cats. So I'll set it to that one and um, whatever I want to do. And then if uh, I want to set the name, I can set the name and pass the number of lives in case it's been killed twice before. And uh, I, can, I can say act. If I say act, <clears throat> remember, this is something that you need to remember from IPC 144 or OOP, beginning of OP244, which when you recreate a variable in an inner scope with the same name, it shadows the old one. Remember that? Okay? It's same thing with functions, with methods in the in inheritance. So if you create an identical method that overwrites, that uh, 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 shadows the base class, it will be called instead. So if I create an act for an animal, uh, for a cat, it overwrites the cat. Uh, act. So ca act, action of cat cannot be called anymore because it is improved now. We all want to change it. That's the whole idea about inheritance, right? It's reusing your code. You ha already have something. You want to make it better. You inherit it to something new. You add features to it or block features if you want to. I'm not implementing the move. It means cat moves like just like any animal. I don't need to add anything new to it. And cat makes a sound like any other animal, and it has an extra thing that plays. Just messing with it. It's just not that the lion cannot play. Of course, they can play. But what I'm saying is that let's say cats play with humans. Let's go to that. Animal lions eat humans, so a bit different. Okay, <clears throat> and then I have a destructor to do whatever I want. So, do we understand what is the syntax, not implementation, the syntax of inheritance? How do we in inherit a class? You create a class, you say is, you bring, a, so what we call this a base class, we call this one a derived class, a base class. Uh, a derived class inherits everything from the, the base class. Now, about the keyboard protected. Like I'm giving, I'm going to give you a bad example. There's many books I've seen old times, long time ago, they used to uh, uh, have parenthood example for inheritance. That's an absolutely wrong thing to do. Like they would say, uh, "I'm like my father." That's inheritance. That's wrong. Okay, inheritance means I'm a mammal, not my father and I. My father and I are same instances, two different objects of the same. Uh, class is a male human being, right? And 
I am the son of my mother, which means my mother had a method called birth that returned a human. You follow what I'm saying? So inheritance means I'm a human. My mother is a human. I'm a male human. My mother is a female human. So essentially, me and my mother are from same species, same class. I cannot say I inherit from my father because if I say integer A and B, B doesn't inherit anything from A. They are two different objects of the same class, right? So that's why I'm saying it's not a good example. Remember that inheritance is reusing design. Inheritance is reusing design. You design something already, you don't want to go through the hassle of designing it again. You simply say, get that design and add these features, right? So I can have, <clears throat> I can say I have vehicle, and out of a vehicle I have a car. That's acceptable. And a car can be instantiated in many different things, right? Um, that's that. Now I'm going to go to the bad example that I told you to explain what protective is. Imagine the bad example of my father and I being inherited, so I'm inheriting from my father. And let's say my father is rich and he has this, I don't know, a Bugatti or 911 Porsche or something. It's his favorite car. And he has a Ford Festiva. Okay? So <clears throat> definitely Ford Festiva is something that I'm allowed to use, right? I can actually borrow that thing and go around with it. But that Porsche 911, I'm not allowed to touch. Okay? So when I'm inheriting stuff from my father, the Porsche 911 is private. It means only my father can use it. I cannot use it. I can ask my father to give me a ride, which means I can use that Porsche 911 indirectly because it's my father's, but I cannot drive it myself. Where that Ford Festiva is protected, which means no one outside of a family is allowed to use it, but I can pick it up for a ride because it's protected. So when I made a method protected in the animal, what I meant is that all the descendants of animal can use that method, but people outside of animal are not allowed to use it. Okay? So going back to what we had before, when I said that the animal has a protected method called name. It means a cat can use the name to, to set its own name, OK? But from outside, I cannot change the name of an animal. That's private. So protected is a protected entity. No one can use it outside of the class. But descendants of the class, they can use it freely. Is that clear? OK, now the syntax of implementation. How do we implement pieces and parts of an inherited class? OK, so <clears throat> let's like it, take a look at the, uh, the, uh, how a cat is actually set. So remember the initialization area? You can still use that. So I can say cat, so I'm creating the constructor of the cat. And I'm going to say over here number of lives is 9. So I am uh, mentioning that I want the number of lives to be set to 9. And I'm going to set the name to Garfield. And I'm going to go as defaulted cat with the, this number of lives, right? When you do not mention how to create the base class, always the default constructor is called. It doesn't matter what type of a constructor of the child you are using. When you create, a, when you create the constructor of the child class, the right class, if you do not mention how to create the base, the base will be defaulted. Which means when this constructor is called, first, the cat becomes nameless because that's what the default constructor of the base class did. 
And then that nameless will be overwritten by Garfield. And then it's going to go up. So remember that. And in this case, we will see that name over here is not initialized in cat. It's initialized in the, the pair. <clears throat> but you can use, you can ask the compiler to create the base any way you want. For example, I create a one argument, a two argument cat constructor, which I pass the name and number of lives in here. And then I'm going to say, I want the animal to get created with the name. So in the initialization area, I call the, I don't call it, I ask the compiler to invoke the base classes, one argument constructor to build the base part. Remember, when we are dealing with a constructor of a derived class, when we are dealing with the constructor um, of the base class, this is what happens. All right. Let me draw it over here, that's easier. So when you, I just want to see my limit, that's my limit. So when you create uh, the, uh, the animal class, this is what happens. It creates the animal, and the animal has its name, whatever it has, okay? That's the animal. When you create a cat, however, cat is not a single individual thing. It, it carries an animal within. Do not assume that these are two different entities. They are actually the same thing. Remember, so when I say a cat, it is an animal. Literally, cat is an animal. So when you create a cat, for a cat to come to being, the first thing that happens is that an animal gets created, and the memory is set. So a big memory will get, a bigger memory will be allocated, and the animal part of it will be set. Then in here, the number of lives will be set. So that's the number of lives that, that I had, okay? So when you create a cat, inside the cat, first the animal is created, and then the cat will complete the, the initialization of the, of the derived class. So the animal is within the cat. Don't think it's a separate thing. It's one object that has two parts. Because it has two parts, the base part has to get created first somehow. And that is under your control. So when you are implementing how a cat gets created, you can always instruct the compiler how to create my base. It's like you are creating a two-story building. You can always, you have to always first say how to first create the first story, otherwise the second, you cannot put it in the air, right? So that's what happens. It is literally the base class. So because of that fact, in here, I'm actually mentioning create the cat, receive the name, receive the number of lives, 
create the animal part of me using the name. Animal has that constructor, so I can actually do it. And then set the number of lives. And as you see, I do not need to have anything in the constructor, actually. It's an empty constructor, because everything is actually done over here. The hugest mistake, the biggest mistake rookie programmers do is this. And they think this is doing the same thing. I'm creating a cat. I'm having the name. I have the number of lives. And I am calling the, the parent's constructor. Remember I was screaming the constructors cannot be called? When you do something like this, what's going to happen? You are creating a cat with the name and number of animals. Did you say how the animal, how the base is supposed to get created? No. So the name will be defaulted. The, 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 the animal will be defaulted. Then, at line 18, a temporary nameless animal will get created. At line 19, that animal will die. It has nothing to do with the cat. You're just creating a separate entity. Constructors cannot be called. Okay? This is the most common mistake, and I'm mentioning it to you right now, and still you're going to do it in the test for some reason, because it's your urge. Like, you have set our functions. You have, you know what I mean? Set empty, and you call it, it sets the object empty. You think, oh, constructor, let me call it, and set. You can't. Remember, constructors can only be requested to be invoked in the initialization area. And the sequence of the things created in the initialization area is actually an important thing. <coughs> if I'm coughing, don't worry, I'm not contagious. I all the drugs known to man. <laughs> okay, so for, for a week, so I'm good. It's just fatigue. Okay. One of the good things about being sick is you lose Wait, I'm like, I, I like lost like two and a half kilos. Anyways, yeah, I'm much thinner now. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so, so what happens is that when I do something like this, remember the sequence of the things you are, I hope you're taking notes on these things. I don't know unless they have identical memories on this. But in the initialization area, the sequence of things being initialized should be the sequence of things you have inside the class. The base always comes first. Now, if you have three attributes inside the class, the first attribute should appear first. The second attribute should appear second, and the third should be third. On Visual Studio, it's not going to give you an error. But if you get it to Linux, it's going to complain that the sequence of initialization is. Because this is not setting. It's initialization. So it kind of needs to be in the order in which the class is getting created, which is top to bottom. Therefore, it should be the same. Now, so that's that. <clears throat> As you see, I am saying act, but the act of the, the, the cat is not the act of the animal anymore. So what it does, it's got to say act playful, calls the name of the thing, the cat. OK? And the sound is different. Sound says, <clears throat> I sound like an animal, and I say meow. So it's still using the parent sound. So you can always use the actions of the parent anywhere you want indirectly by using the name of the class and scope resolution and the name of the method. Remember, animal over here is not an object. It's part of you. It's part of the cat. That's why you don't use dot. You are telling sound of my animal part should be called. So it literally goes to the animal part and picks up the sound. And play is a completely different thing that an animal doesn't even have. It's an improvement that I have for the cat. 
And the destructor of the cat is the same thing. The destructor, you don't need to mention the destructor of the, because it's destructor, when it's destroyed, everything's going to get destroyed, right? There is an exception on that we're going to see soon. Questions? Yes. You don't need to. Depends on the logic. Does your logic require it? What I'm saying is that you can. In many cases, you do. Mm, I can't say most of the time. It's a dangerous thing to say. Most of the time you do, then all the students start calling them. You should look at your business logic. See, if, is your, does your business logic require to use the old method of the parent and then add to it, or you want to completely abandon it and create a new logic. It all depends on you. That's why I have, sorry if I'm making it longer because it's an important question. You can ignore it like the act, or you can reuse it like the sound. It's your choice. But if you want to reuse it, it's base class scope resolution method to call the base classes. I could call the act inside the sound if I wanted to. There is nothing to prevent me, prevent, uh, prevent uh, this thing. You can, it's literally a method of the parent that you're calling. When I'm saying of the parent, don't think of it as, as a separate thing. When I'm saying it's a method of a parent, it's a method of you, but your parent's side. Remember that. Again, going to the bad example, my father actually was a teacher. He used to teach mechanics. I teach computer science. My sister teaches child psychology. So it runs in a family kind of thing. So when you think about it, I'm overriding my parents' teaching. I'm overriding, again, bad example. Me and my parents, I'm sorry if I'm, my back is doing <laughs> I just have to sit for a second. So yeah, so what I'm saying is that, you see the bird turn your back uh, on the students unless you're writing something on a board. That's why I'm a part of it. All right. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, keep that in mind, okay? Um, if you overwrite, you can just ignore what you had before, which got to bring, bring us to the next thing. So, first, let's run this and see what happens. And after we run this and see what happens, we're going to continue with the rest of the thing to see actually what implications these things going to actually create. So I'm going to go to main and see what we have in main. So in main, I am creating animal A, Coco, and I'm creating a cat called Fluffy. I am defining a cat as, uh, as G for uh, a default cat. And remember, you can always refer to, an, to a cat as an animal. So you, that's one of the things about inheritance. You can always use the address or reference of the parent to look at your derived class. Okay? You can always use the reference of the base class to refer to the derived class. But the problem is that if you do that, it will forget that it's a, it's a cat. Remember, the rule of closest call. Any reference or anything that you have, closest method to that reference will be called. So if it's an animal reference, all the animal things are preferred. OK? So we'll see what happens. So, let's run the, oh, stop. I'm going to set this one as a startup. So remember, if you want to call different ones, you have to right click on the project. Now, this solution is one of those that has many projects in it, okay? Because I wanted to improve on the previous one, that's why I did that. So what do we have in main? Let's start and see. <coughs> oh, 
Okay, so so it creates animal. It has nothing to do with the cat. If you inherit something from a base class, when you create the base class, it's as if the derived class doesn't exist. So I create an animal. Why do I care there is a cat? Absolutely no need to think of the existence of a cat. So it does everything that it did before, which is it says overriding uh, the uh, overriding the, and it has nothing in here with Coco. When it says the, it means I'll tell you what happened over here. So in in the animal, in here I am calling the name to overwrite, and oh, that calls overwrite. But because I have blank the name, so it's gonna say overriding the. In here, it's supposed to print the name of the previous thing because it's, a, it's not a good design. I'm just showing you how things work. Anyways, walk through it at home, and you'll see exactly what it is. And now it's going to actually call cat. So that one, I'm going to actually go inside and see how it's going to work out. So let's go inside. Now it comes in here. Because I mentioned I want the animal to be created that way, before anything happens inside the cat, constructor, it will go to the animal and create the animal using the name, as you see. Okay? So it's going to say overriding the, and it's going to say creating the fluffy. And because, because the, uh, I'm, I keep using the, uh, uh, the name setter inside the, the constructor, uh, and the class is created by default blank, it doesn't show overriding the thing. So it's going to create fluffy, and then it goes out. And obviously, and it's going to say, as a cat with, did I just put over the wit instead of with? Uh, no. Oh. Ah, it's a, sorry, it's a bug in, in, uh, in the command line. There you go. For some reason, it shortens it. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I thought I printed it wrong. Right now. So it says creating fluffy the animal as a cat with five lives, right? And then it comes up. And when you create a cat by default, in here I'm not mentioning how to create the animal, therefore the default constructor of the animal is called, which is gonna create the no name thingy. Overwriting the with no name. Let me fix that. That, that is actually bothering me. Uh, I'm going to go to animal.cpp. Where is that thing that overwrites? Name. OK, so in here, I'm going to say overriding the. I'm going to put this one in parentheses. And I'm going to say, if it has something, put m name. Otherwise, put uh, uh, empty name, OK? <laughs> so overwriting the empty name. So um, now it's going to make more sense. So So now it's going to do this. So it's going to say, oh, oh, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. My, I'm a very bad person. I'm a bad, bad, bad person. Where's the name? Uh, name zero, my friend, not that. It's not dynamic memory allocation. It's just a regular. So I'm going to say if the name is empty. <coughs> Let's do it one more time. Hopefully you know what I did wrong, right? The, it's not dynamic, therefore M name has address of something, of those that something is nothing, but it has address of something. Now I'm looking at the first element, and it's null because it's a string, 
that is empty. So overriding the empty name with Coco, creating Coco the animal. And for the other one, it's going to be the same thing, overriding the empty name with Fluffy, creating Fluffy the animal as a cat with five lives. Now it's going to create the default the cat, and when it defaults the cat, it calls the default constructor, and it's going to say overwriting the empty name with no name, because it's uh, an empty one, and defaulting an animal, animal with no name, and it comes out. Now it's going to come over here and actually overwrite the no name with Garfield, and uh, as a defaulted cat with nine lives. So as you see, when you do not mention how to create the base class, it will create it, uh, it will call the default constructor. And that doesn't have to be default constructor. If I do not mention animal over here, it will happen the same way. So when I create a cat, if I do not want the animal to be set in any specific way, I just don't put anything in here. And in a two argument constructor, the animal will get created by default. Then. But if you don't do that, you must have a default constructor. If you don't have a default constructor, you're going to get a problem. You're going to get a compilation error saying that I need to default the animal, but you don't have any default constructor, therefore it's going to die. Go fiddle with these codes. Change the things and make sure it fails on you. Okay? The back to the main. Why do you call the calls the address of the animal to point to the cat? That wasn't an address of an animal, bad boy. That was a reference. A reference. I mean. Yeah, I just said well, you, you, you can that? call me Mr. Soliman, right? <laughs> instead of Farda. Okay. That's what I'm doing. I'm calling it Mr. Animal instead of cat because cat is an animal. It can be referred to as an animal. But Am I a human being? But doesn't that defeat the purpose of creating the cat? It's much deeper than that. Okay? Uh, you're, you're right. He's actually absolutely right. That's the purpose of writing it, to show you that it's the, that's, it defeats the purpose, purpose of it. And I'm going to, in the next thing, I'm going to show you. Give me two seconds. Very observative, my friend. Okay. So, so yeah, it's defaulted now, and now we're going to defeat the purpose of inheritance and refer to the cat as an animal. So if I tell the animal G to act, it's going to uh, act playful Garfield the cat. But if I say AG, which is a, 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 an animal uh, reference for Garfield, you'll see that it's going to act like an animal, which means it forgets that it was a cat. Are we okay with this? You can. Okay, but that's the case. And then, so if I say cat, act, cat, move. See, act is overwritten, but move is not. So move is going to move like an animal. Sound is going to sound like animal, but it's going to say meow afterwards because it's improved. Play is going to be playful. and But an, an animal acts and moves like an animal. Actually... This is obvious because this is literally from the main that we had before. No difference. Are we okay now at this point? Okay, so the next thing we need to do over here is actually... Uh, so, so that's that. That's literally the syntax of inheritance. Now, let's talk about defining the purpose. What happens when you actually refer to a, to a, to a, a, a derived class using the base? What are the implications for it? And what are the remedies for it? To be able to make the, the cat remember it was a cat, even if it's re re referred to as an animal. That's the beauty of it. So in object orientation, if you say, Mr. Soleimanlu, come and teach, I'm going to start teaching mechanics because my father did mechanics. When you refer to me with my father's name, then I'm going to start teaching mechanics. If you ask my sister, Mrs. Soliman, to come and teach, she's not going to teach child psychology. She's going to teach you mechanics because it's his parents' thing. To actually ask me to teach C++ object orientation, you have to say, Fardad, teach. So you should use my own. We need to know how we can fix it. And 
and there's problems with this too. So I'm going to go to the exact same thing, the question that Mr. Ashton okay, had over here. <laughs> I'm not going to forget your name. One of the rarest cases, because I'm very bad with names. But uh, anyway, so, so let's see what happens. <coughs> oh, let's see what happens when I do this. So I have cat, P. Pepper, okay. And now I have an animal pointer. I am creating a dynamic cat in it. I can, right? Because cat is an animal. Therefore, it can be pointed by an animal pointer, right? You can show me, see, hey, look at it, a human, right? I'm a human. You can refer me to that one. I'm okay, right? Uh, you didn't say anything wrong. <clears throat> animal reference find it's to P. So AR is pointing to a, a cat. Uh, is uh, referring to a cat, and AP is pointing to a cat, okay? And obviously, I have an animal by itself. Now, as I mentioned, where we go through this, when we go through this, let me just check something not to ruin the... <clears throat> Okay, so as I was mentioning, this cat actually overrides everything. It, it overrides the move and everything. Okay, so I, I, I overrode everything on the, uh, of the animal. Now, when I run the program right now, you will see that It comes over here, obviously it passes the, the thing to the, to the animal. It comes over here, calls the, the name, oh, uh, and creates Pepper the animal. And uh, then it comes out and as a cat with nine lives, and it keeps going like that. Now, a new cat is created. So when a new cat is created, it doesn't matter what is the pointer that is coming. Remember, an assignment happens in two stages. First, the right side happens. Ends, when it's finished, the result is passed to the left one. Are we okay with this? So in here, you need to realize that Tom, although it's being, uh, Tom the cat, although it's being kept into an animal pointer, but it will first get created as an animal, which is fine. So it actually runs as an animal. Everything's good and fine and dandy. So it creates the animal and all the good stuff that it creates uh, uh, and everything's set, but it's being gonna be set as an animal. And in here is a reference, we've already done that, and Simba, we already done that, we don't care. We're gonna come call the pepper, and everything will run as pepper. Are we okay with this? An animal, a, a cat pointed as a cat, everything is good. Now, the one with animal reference, it is still P, right? I'm just referring, use, referring it using the animal reference. And when I do that, <coughs> it completely forgets that it was a cat. Define the purpose of inheritance. Now, same thing with uh, the animal pointer. It forgets that it was that. Now, this is where we are in trouble. This is where we are in trouble. I am deleting the animal pointer. When you say delete animal pointer, what happens? What does the compiler do? Compiler doesn't know it's pointing to a cat. It will only call the destructor of the animal and the cat is going to leak into memory so essentially what happens is that yes what happens is this when you delete a dynamic cat that is pointed by animal compiler does this The rest of it is still in memory. That's memory leak. That's the problem that we need to fix. And
and then it keeps going further and further, and life is beautiful and everything is good. The rest of it are, are dead proper, uh, killed properly. So in here, <clears throat> as you see, uh, removing Tom the animal, nothing from cat part. His cat part is not deleted. But when you remove Simba, it, the cat will be removed. Uh, Simba is uh, an animal, but when you remove the pepper, when the pepper goes out of scope, because it was an animal with a reference of an animal, the, the animal part is deleted too. Both constructors, only one constructor. Okay? So how do we fix this? The fix is extremely easy. The only thing you need to do is that when you create a class, you should think, will this class ever be used as a base class? You have to ask yourself. So when you create a class, you should think, is this class will ever be used as a base class? The answer would be yes. If that's the case, if the answer is yes, in that case, you should see which one of the methods may need to be improved, OK? To fix the problem that we had with the previous one. To fix the problem that we had with the previous one. So the problem that we had with the previous one was that when we actually ran the program, what happens is that the animal parts didn't get deleted, and that had that caused proper that that caused problem. Okay, uh, let me just go over here. When we had a cat point, uh, an animal pointer pointing to a cat, when it was getting deleted, it wouldn't delete. The, the, the derived part. All you need to do is to go over here and tell to the compiler, the destructor that you see over here is not the main one, is not the real one. Look to see if something newer is in hand. So you can tell to the compiler, this function is not the main one, is not the real one. This function is the virtual one. See if there is a newer version. If there is, call that one. So what do I do in here? In front of the destructor, that's the, that's the only thing you need to do. You write that. Done. So I'm saying the destructor is virtual, which means if you are creating an animal, virtuality doesn't even do anything. You have an animal, you have an animal pointer, nothing comes to play. But when you create a cat and it wants to delete the animal pointer that is pointing to a cat, it says, oh, it's virtual. Let me see if there is a newer constructor, destructor. Yes, there is. It's cats. It calls that one. And because cat is getting deleted, it wipes everything up. Got it? So that's how it happens. And any other method. Like, for example, I want the act to be the latest version. I make it virtual. I want the, the sound to be uh, the latest version always. I'll make that a virtual. So the methods that are virtual guarantees that no matter how you refer to a class, always the latest version of the function will be called. Always. 
That fixes the problem. Now, if I actually have, so let's actually go through it and take a look at it. Now, when it's actually running, when I have an animal, I don't care. Animal is an animal, virtuality doesn't come even to play. So when you see a class is being referred to it by its own reference or pointer, you don't even look for virtuals. You don't care if there's a, anything is virtual or not. Okay? Virtuality only guarantees that the latest version is called in the hierarchy of inheritance. Therefore, <clears throat> now, and the other one too, I have a cat and cat the pepper, so I, I don't care, I just go through it. Now in here, I have an animal pointer and an animal reference pointing. Now let's take a look. <clears throat> animal is an animal, I don't care, everything's gonna act like an animal. Cat is a cat, I don't care, everything's gonna act like a cat, right? This is where it comes, becomes interesting. Now, C is a cat pointer that point to a cat. Again, I don't care. Cat to cat, everything acts like a cat, I don't care. Now I have an animal reference telling my object to act. Because animal reference is pointing the reference of the cat, instead of calling the act of the animal, it will call the latest version of it. Why? Because I made the act virtual. Because the act is virtual, it guarantees that the latest version is called, therefore act will be the act of the cat. I did not make the move virtual. Because it's not virtual, it's not upgradable. Anything that you want to make sure is not going to get upgraded and remains as is, you don't make it virtual. When you make it virtual, it means it becomes upgradable. Now, if I actually run this, of course, it's going to act like an animal. Sound was made virtual, so that's going to uh, do meow and then sound, so it actually act like a cat. And the same thing with animal pointer. So with animal pointer, everything works exactly the same way. Now, the beautiful thing is that when I actually, the deleting cat that points to a cat, I don't care. When I do that, it goes to the destructor of the cat, removes the cat, and then goes to the destructor of the animal and removes the animal, which is very fine. The problem I had was deleting an animal pointer pointing to a cat. Because the destructor is virtual, it guarantees that the latest version of the destructor will be called first. Therefore, this delete will actually call the, the cat's destructor. Therefore, everything is deleted and life is beautiful and so on and so forth. Are we okay down to this point? Now, <clears throat> I have a function called tickle. Okay? So when I tickle the animal, <clears throat> I am passing the animal as a reference. So what happens, the beautiful thing about it is that when you pass the reference of the base class, you don't care what type of an object in the hierarchy is passed. Automatically, it will select the latest version. If you pass as an animal, an animal will be tickled. If you pass a cat to it, a cat will be tickled. Okay? Because the sound is virtual. So, <clears throat> Although the first one is an animal, uh, the first one is an animal, it goes to, to tickle and it makes sound like an animal and I say ah ha ha. And when now I actually pass a cat to that one, because a reference is an animal reference, if it wasn't virtual, it wouldn't upgrade. But because I made sound a virtual, it actually sounds like meow and goes like that. And so on and so forth. So again, what are virtual functions? This is an interview answer, okay? So you go apply for a job, they're gonna ask you what is a virtual function? Your answer is gonna be, it guarantees the latest version of the method is called. 
virtuals guarantee that the latest version of the method is called, now you can add this, no matter how you refer or point to the object. Okay? Is that clear for everyone? Yes. Always the latest version. So let's put it like that. Let's say I have animal, I have feline, I have cat. Okay? If the first one is virtual, automatically everything becomes virtual. So if you create a cat, you look at a cat as an animal, still cat will be called. If you look at a cat as a feline, still cat will be called. In a hierarchy of inheritance, the first, from the first place you make something virtual, right to the end, it guarantees the latest version it called. It doesn't care how many levels of inheritance you have. That's literally the definition. Latest version in the hierarchy of inheritance. Are we okay with this? We'll come to that example too. Now, <clears throat> that brings us to another thing. That virtuality actually helps us with the design tremendously. We'll see how. Oh, I get dizzy. <clears throat> so, I get my apology. Uh, what do I say? Okay, example. Uh, what is your native language? Punjabi. Punjabi. My native language is Azerbaijani. What is your na native language? Tagalog. 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 Okay. Never heard of it, but I'm learning now. <laughs> okay. Tagalog. Thank you. Okay. Punjabi, Azerbaijanian, Tagalog. Right? We know human beings can talk. Do you have any doubt in that? No matter where you're from, no matter if, even if you have never seen civilization ever in your life, you have some kind of a language. Right? We know human beings can talk. Now, if you're a programmer, and I ask you, does a human being call, has, do, have a, has a human being a method called talk? The answer is yes. And I'm going to ask you, implement it. Can you? How do you know? Tagali, Azerbaijanian, or Punjabi? You don't know. You know it can talk, but you cannot implement it. You follow what I'm saying? Many of the methods that you create for objects, they're obvious they have that feature. But it's still not known until I actually create a male Tagalian language out of it. Tagali is the uh, uh, race to, can I call it that way? Like, uh, it's Filipino. Oh, Filipino. Thank you. So I just, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm bad knowledge learning. So unless I create a Filipino human being, or an Azerbaijanian human being, or a Punjabi human being out of it, I cannot define the talk. The talk is not definite yet. Do we understand this? So how do we implement this? I want to tell that a human being is talk. I want to be able to enforce human beings talking without implementing it. So I force anybody who wants to inherit from my human to inherit talking. Otherwise, that human is not a human. How do I do that? Very simple. At any moment, that you want to enforce something to be created in future. I think I opened the wrong one. Yes. At any moment when you want to enforce something to be created in future, you make a virtual function and you set it to zero. What does it mean? This function must exist. Not yet. An animal must make a sound. 
I don't know how yet, but I know it should. If it's a dog, it's a wolf. If it's a cat, it's a meow. I know it makes a sound. How? I do not know. That is called a pure virtual function. A pure virtual function enforces the creation of a method in future instances. Do you get that? This is very important. So this enforcement makes the animal incomplete. If, uh, if you're the best sculptor in the world, if you're Michelangelo, and I ask you to create a sculpture of a human being, you can't. Why? Because you don't know if it's a male or a female. They have different shapes. You cannot sculpt it, no matter how talented you are. My definition of a human being is incomplete because it doesn't have gender, whatever that gender is. So when I implement that gender, now I know what I am dealing with. Now I can create the sculpture. For Do we understand this? So this is the same thing over here. For this sound thingy over here, I'm saying, so if I want to instantiate the animal, it's going to tell me animal is an abstract base class and cannot get instantiated. What is abstract? An abstract is an idea. It's something that you want it to be there, but you cannot finish it yet. You leave it to the other programmers to do so. Therefore, an abstract base class <coughs> is a class that you cannot instantiate. So if in my main, so now you see I have a cat and I have a dog. Okay? Now, the dog of mine will do a woof woof and a cat of mine Cat, 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 cat. We'll do a meow. You follow? <clears throat> and they are overriding the pure virtual function of the animal. So, in my main, in my main, first of all, if I do this, it's not going to allow me immediately if I come over here object of abstract class type animal is not allowed. You cannot create an instance of it. It has a pure virtual. Okay? And then, <clears throat> so I'm going to comment that. But this is the beauty of it. So now take a look at this, please. This is interesting. So when we come over here, when I run this, <clears throat> It is actually, so I'm creating a dog. Now I'm creating an array of four animal pointers. In one of them, I put a cat, in next one, a dog, and a cat, and an and a address of a dog. Are we okay with this? So this animal pointer of mine has four different animals in it. All I, so when I come over here, I say, hey, make a sound. I'm going to, at this point, when you are looking at the animal over here, P0 is an animal, right? Do you know how it's going to sound? No. Do you care? No. It is virtual. It knows which one to call. So when I ask the first animal to make a sound, it's going to say meow. The second one is going to say wolf, meow, and wolf automatically selects the latest version of it. No if statement, nothing. This is real polymorphism. Overloading was fake. You change the signature different by thing. This one, the functions are identical. And they are being chosen automatically by the type. You don't need to even think about it. That's why object orientation becomes easy to program. It does, it doesn't, you can create much more complicated stuff because if you design properly, you design and you forget. Everything knows, all objects know 
how to get called to do their responsibilities properly. And when I'm deleting one by one, of course I'm deleting the first three because the fourth one is not dynamic. When you delete them, automatically the proper destructor is called. I don't need to worry about. It. Now, <clears throat> do we understand what pure ritual functions are? Do we? Sometimes a class is nothing but a thought, a thinking, a design. Sometimes you have a class that only has pure virtual functions in it and nothing else. These type of things are called interfaces in object-oriented methodology. In C++, no difference. One or all, they are all abstract-based classes. We don't care. C++, abstract-based class, interface, potatoes, potatoes. If you have one, you're abstract. If you have all, you're abstract. But in object orientation, we call interfaces the classes who have only pure virtual methods in it and nothing else. Okay? Which is your, I think, milestone two? Yeah. Or is it two? Yeah. 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 So that's all you do. And that's why you only have two days to write it, because you're just writing a class with prototype of a function is equal to zero in front of it. That's it. Nothing else. The question that I have yesterday. <laughs> That is, I'm having to define the, the function in one semester. Okay, but for the destructor, if I did, didn't define the. Th that's the next thing I'm going to say. That's the next thing I'm going to say. From now on, from now on, till the day you die, you create a class, your destructor is virtual. You never create a non virtual destructor. That should be the default of the system. We should teach that on day one when we teach you destructors. But because you don't know what virtuals are, we don't tell you. Destructors must always be virtual because you never know if an object is going to be inherited or not. And if, you don't, and if the object is inherited, then you may have memory leak. Virtual destructors don't affect anything if the class is created with its own handle. But if the class is inherited, then virtuals guarantee that there is no memory leak. So from now on, if I see you creating any, if you have any destructors in your project, make them all virtual. All destructors from now on till the end of time should be virtual. You should never create a destructor that is not virtual. Is that clear? So it's the syntax of the destructor. Virtual tilde destructor. You don't create just a destructor. Yes? But the definition, we, we, are, we have to do the definition. No, you just write equal to default. If you don't, if you, if, uh-huh, <clears throat> two things. All your classes must have a destructor, even if they don't need to. That's number one. Rule number two, that destructor must be Virtual. And if you don't want to write anything in it, just write equal to default. So <clears throat> if I want the animal over here, so this is, this is what I'm going to do. See, over here, virtual destructor. If I do not want to do anything in here, all I need to do is to say default. And that is the same as saying that uh, delete, end, data, no, no, it doesn't, no, no, it doesn't mean anything. It means it's an empty destructor. It does nothing. All it does, it adds a virtual flag to the destructor. It guarantees that the latest version is called. It is not going to do jack for you. Nothing. All it does is a tag of virtuality for the destructor. So if your class doesn't need a virtual, this doesn't need a destructor, this is what you write. If it does need a destructor, make it virtual and write the implementation. So we do not have a class that doesn't have a destructor anymore. You create, even if, it doesn't, even if you are creating a structure that is not a class, create a destructor like that and make it default, always. So from now on, all your classes must have a destructor. If the destructor is not required, you just put an equal to default in front of it. If the destructor is required, you make it virtual and you implement. Is that clear? Okay.
So, <clears throat> I think I can bring the next one in too. So we're going to do this. <laughs> Therefore, now I can have an animal, and that animal of mine is an interface. Okay? Forget about that external bull thingy that's from a long time ago. I'll fix that later. Because this one didn't have the utils, I'll add the utils later on. I didn't want to bring this in yet, so I didn't prepare it. That's what an interface looks like. You have everything set. You see there is no constructor, nothing. You set everything to zero because they are all pure virtual. And you have a destructor that is defaulted. And that's an interface. Now, if we actually look at the classes, I'm going to prepare it for the next time. I didn't think that we're going to get here, but we got it. So now I have a pet that is an animal. And out of a pet, I have a cat. That is a cat. So I have animal, pet, and cat. And the hierarchy of inheritance goes further. And if you want to see the hierarchy of inheritance, you can always do this. You can create a class diagram, and you can bring the things there. So it actually shows I have an animal, I have a pet, and I have a cat. So it actually shows the inheritance to you. Just drag and drop the header files into the class. Create add in utilities a class diagram, drag and drop the header files, it creates the scheme of what you have. So uh, a cat is a pet that is an animal. Are we okay with this? Questions? Right click on utilities. Okay, let me create it. So right click on sort resources, add, new item, go to utilities. Do I have utilities anywhere? There you go. And then class diagram, add. That's an empty one. Now drag all the things that you want to be added from the header file. So I'll go to my class diagram. And I'll drag the first header file and drop it in there. And the next one. And the next one. I can drag and drop utils too, but I don't know what is in utils, so. Yeah, there we go, that's utils. It has nothing to do with anything. So, uh, so this is what we have. And you can always expand this to make it to see all the properties and everything. And see what you have in them. And utility doesn't belong, and the, the utils doesn't belong to anything. So it has only, oh, I double clicked so it opened it. So it actually shows all the things it has. Are we okay with this? Questions? Suggestions?
Objections? The next day you are coming in, we are having a lecture. Remember that. Okay? <clears throat> I think that's it. Have yourself a beautiful day.